Oh, I don't. And, uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce you to the all the here. So, <clears throat> his own is Bhakti Vignu Maharaj. He is a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. He came in Krishna consciousness in 1971 in London. He has been an exemplary brahmachari in his early days. And later on in 1994, he was awarded sannyas. And since then he has been traveling uh, and preaching very actively. Especially <coughs> has been preaching in Asian countries like Philippines, China, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand. And he has also been preaching in India. Maharaj is known for his simple living and high thinking. And he is really ideal sadhu who walks his talk. He sees Sanatana Goswami glorified Haridas Thakur. That he says that there are some people who are very good in talking, but their behavior is not very appropriate. Their prachar is powerful, but achar is not good. And some people, their achar is very good, but they don't do prachar. But you are in the Astakur, Sanatana Goswami says. Your achar and prachar are both exemplary. And similarly, we can say about his only Bhakti Vignavinash Maharaj that his achar and prachar is both exemplary and therefore he, much, he is very much loved and respected in Vaishnava community and devotees uh, like to uh, learn and hear from him. He has been also uh, teaching uh, in Mayapur Institute uh, for many decades now <clears throat> and he has trained so many students worldwide. So it is our good fortune that whenever Maharaj comes to Mayapur, he makes point to give his association to Calcutta devotees. So we are very honored and grateful to have His Holiness Bhakti Vigna Vinashat Narasimha Maharaj with us. So let us welcome him by loudly chanting three times. Aribo! 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 Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Prabhu. My obeisances to everyone. All right. I will, uh, I will just ask everybody. Uh, dear devotees, everybody is able to hear Maharaj, kindly unmute and uh, share because we would like to see that everybody understands. Yes, yes, yes so we can hear clearly. You are able to hear, no? wonderful, thank you. And you can, uh, as far as possible, you can keep your video on, uh, if your network permits. If network is not permitting, then, okay, you can close the video. Okay, thank you Maharaj. Maharaj thank, now, thank you. Thank you. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Narayanam namaskrityam naram chaiva narotamam daivim sarasatim vyasam tato jayamudirayat nasta praeshu vabhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama shloke bhaktir bhavati naishtaki So we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, chapter number 14 entitled Lord Brahma's Prayers to Lord Krishna, text number 51. Tadrajendra yatasneha Swaswakatmani dehinam Swaswakatmani dehinam Natata mamata lambi Natata mamata lambi Putra Vita Grihadishu Putra Vita Grihadishu Okay, we'll go right to the word meaning. Okay. Uh, uh. Tat, Tat uh, th Therefore Therefore Raja Indra Raja Indra O uh, best of kings O best of kings Yata, yata as, as sneha, sneha the affection the affection swa, swaka, swa, swaka of each individual 
of each individual atmani atmani for the self for the self dehinam dehinam of the embodied beings of the embodied beings na na not not tata tata thus thus mamata mamata alambi alambi for that which one identifies with as his possessions for that which one identifies with as his possessions putra putra sons vita vita wealth griha griha homes adishu adish and so on and so on translation for the sri no best of kings the embodied soul is self-centered he is more attached to his own body and self than to his so-called possessions like children wealth and home purport by his divine grace oh and no actually this purport is by the followers of his divine grace i think right yes yeah the Prabhupada only translated up to chapter 13. Okay, purport. Uh, it is common practice all over the world for a mother to kill her own child within the womb if the birth of that child represents any inconvenience for her. Similarly, grown children eagerly place their elderly parents in lonely institutions rather than be inconvenienced by their presence at home these and innumerable other examples prove that people in general are more attached to their own body and self which represent i-ness than to their family and other possessions which represent minus although conditioned souls are very proud of their so-called love for society family and so forth in reality every conditioned soul is acting on the platform of gross and subtle selfishness om gyanate marandasya gyananjana shalakaya Chaksurun militan yena tas my Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakdama Yam Dadati Swapadantikam Bandiham Sri Gara Sri Yatapada Kamalam Sri Gurun Vaishnavamsya Shri Rupam Sakrajatam Sahagana Raganatan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitam Stya He Krishna Karana Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanustate Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Namaom Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Payevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadegor Bhaktavinda 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Translation. Is it possible to on your video? You want my video on? The video is on, then it would be even better. Really? Let me see. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, translation again. For this reason, O best of kings, the embodied soul is self-centered. He is more attached to his own body and self than to his so-called possessions like children, wealth and home. Uh, I'd like to begin this class, first of all, by offering homage to my dear God brother, Yashomati Nandan Prabhu, who left the world yesterday over in Ahmedabad. He was a very dear friend and a wonderful disciple of Srila Prabhupada. He came to the Krishna Consciousness Movement in 1970, 71. And Srila Prabhupada met him in America. He was working, working in the USA in a motor car industry there. So he had a good job and somehow he met the devotees and he was immediately attracted. Of course, he was born in a Brahmana family. His name was Joshi. Joshi. So they were Brahmins and he came to Krishna consciousness and he just loved it. It was just so natural for him. And Prabhupada met him and when Prabhupada was touring America and over in Detroit, he met Yashomati Nandan and so Prabhupada immediately encouraged him to come to India and help to establish Krishna consciousness in India. And Yashomati Nandan did this. He came with his American wife and Radhakun Maharaji and uh, they both worked very selflessly for 50 years. They've been, they've been 50 years now, they've been in India. So they made great sacrifices. India in the 1970s, very difficult, not easy at all. Of course, he was Indian, but still he came from America. He gave up life in America to come to India and he established the preaching. Now they have like 14 or 15 centers in Gujarat and all the books have been translated. So he's a wonderful example of somebody who was really dedicated to the Self, the Supreme Self, Krishna. Here in this verse, Sukadeva Goswami is speaking to Maharaj Parikshit and he's describing, well, of course, Sukadeva Goswami was replying to Maharaj Parikshit's question. Maharaj Parikshit wanted to understand how it is that the people of Vrindavan are, are the, the mothers, the cowherd ladies in Vrindavan, and, the, and also the cows in Vrindavan, that they became so affectionate to, the, to Krishna. When Krishna expanded himself as the cowherd boys and the cows, the, the ladies, the, the, the mothers of the boys and the mothers of the cows became more affectionate to, to these cows and these boys than they were to their own offspring. So Maharaj Parikshit wanted to understand how this could happen, how it is that they were more attached to Krishna than to their own children. So Shukadeva Goswami is explaining the nature of this, that what everyone is actually attracted to or actually attached to is the Self. Of course, out of ignorance, when people are in ignorance, they identify the self as the body. Anyway, in, in this verse today, Sukadeva Goswami is describing that 
people are more attached to their own body than they are to possessions. They have possessions like home and children. We th Prabhupada gives some, ex or rather in the purport, we're given some examples here about how people often perform abortions all over the world. It's done. Any, if it means any inconvenience or any burden for the mother, then she, she won't hesitate to have an abortion. And I've seen in our Krishna consciousness movement, I've met devotees who have told me how they had abortions. And they told me, they said, well, I didn't know at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't understand that we were actually, actually killing life. They said, I thought the life actually began after the birth. So people have that ignorance. Of course, once they become devotees, then they can reflect on this sin and they understand that they did wrong and they feel very guilty about it. But still, it's such a common thing which takes place all over the world, in India as well as America, China, everywhere these, these things are done. And people don't even think, they don't even feel any guilt about it. And people involved in it also, they don't think about it either. People in the hospital, the doctors doing the, this, up this uh, killing, they don't feel any compassion, they don't have any thoughts about it. So that, that was one example. And then the other example was about how people treat the elderly people, putting them into the old people's homes, which is also common around the world. Even in India, sometimes elderly people or even widows, as soon as a woman is a widow, send her to Vrindavan. Put her in the ashram for the widows in Vrindavan, even though the woman may have no religious interests, but the family don't want to be bothered with her. Therefore, put her into the widow's ashram in Vrindavan. Leave her there. We don't want her at home. And elderly people like that, they put them in old people's homes. Nobody wants to be bothered with them. So why is it like that? Because people are so interested more in their own self than in others. They think more about their own well-being. They don't care much about others. As devotees, we try to cultivate the, feel, the feeling of, or the mood of compassion, caring about others and being concerned for their welfare. But we know it's just the opposite, it's the opposite thinking in the material world. In the material world, everybody, on, they're only thinking about their self. It's a struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest, right? The rat race, we would call it. The biggest, fastest rat survives. And the others can perish, let them all go. Who cares about them? People are very selfish in their working and in their thinking. They don't have any mood of caring for others. And when people do care, we see often that caring is done simply on the bodily platform. Just like we know Calcutta, there's you know, caring going on. Mother Teresa began her work there, caring for the sick, caring, giving them home, giving them food. But what is the real care? That often is not appreciated. What, how to actually care for others. And so this, of course, was the purpose of the Krishna Consciousness Movement to awaken 
people to understand their actual self, to get people out of the ignorance of illusion of simply being the body. So Prahlad Maharaj speaks about Janasya Mohoyam Maham Mamiti, this identification with the body comes in the form of thinking, first of all, I am the body. And when we think I am the body, then we think this is mine, this belongs to me. But as we hear from this verse, the conception of I as a body is more important than the conception of what belongs to me. We, we're willing to sacrifice what belongs to me to save the I, to save our own bodies. If there's a fire in the house, then, you know, you're going to save yourself first. Sometimes when you go in the airplane, they often tell you, you know, when, if you have to get off the plane during an emergency landing, just leave everything. Don't try to bring anything. Just get off the plane. You know, they don't want you to worry about your baggage or anything. Of course, most people will be like that. They simply want, they want to save their body. They'll, they'll sacrifice their wealth and their treasures and their cash just to save the body. It's more important to them. They can always get more money. They can always get another laptop. They can always get, a, you know, they can always somehow replace the things they've lost. But they can't replace the body. So the body is very dear to them because they think of the body as their self. So Krishna consciousness is to awaken people to what is the actual self, the real sense of identity, knowing who we are. This kind of education, of course, is so much lacking in the modern society to try to bring people to this platform to understand the spiritual nature of every living entity. It's very difficult. Why? Because people are so sinful. People are so attached. They're so committed to sense gratification. And the most important, whose sense gratification is the most important? Their own. They will, the, sometimes we see, uh, I, w I was in China and I, uh, I heard about one, one family, because in China what happened, there was a revolution cultural revolution. So a lot of people, when they saw how the communism was taking over and influencing the country, many people wanted to get out of the country. But not many could get out. But some of them did and they just got out and they just left everything. And they left their family, they le you know, women, I met women who left their husbands and children they just got out, they just wanted to get out, just save themselves. Just like when there's a fire. Some devoted mothers, they want to go in and save their children. But there are others who just stand and cry. They won't even try to save them. So this identification with the self, self and being... Uh, self-centered and attached to his own body. This is the darkest ignorance of human life. One is in the human form of life and he does not inquire about the purpose of his existence. So he is condemned in the Vedic scriptures. He is uh, described to be a very miserly person. Yashatma buddhi guna petri dathuke swadi kalatradishu boma ijadi yatirta buddhi shalalena karachit janish babigneshu saiva gokara.
Right? They're described to be as foolish as a cow or an ass. Because they're thinking, Yasatma buddhi guna petri dakute, that I am this body which is made up of mucus, bile, and air. These elements. We're thinking, this is me. I'm just, I, my existence is based on these things. And they have no higher understanding of the spiritual nature of the living being. But that kind of realization can be awakened, and we do see it awakened gradually when people become, particularly when people become elderly in age, nearer to death, then they think more about the future. They think about where am I going from here? Thoughtful people will begin to inquire what happens at the time of death? Where do we go? Srila Prabhupada describes how sometimes at, at the time of when, when a person dies, there are some people they like to decorate the dead body and they carry the dead body in procession to the crematorium or to the morgue and the body is all decorated. They want the body to look nice, but the body is dead. So this is another type of ignorance of the human being. That we're not understanding the actual person who is within the body, the spiritual nature. Therefore, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna begins his the teachings to Arjuna by smashing Arjuna's so-called compassion. Arjuna was presenting so many arguments why he shouldn't fight. He was expressing his compassion that, oh, what about the, there may be Varna Sankara and how will I enjoy and the sinful reactions that you want me to kill people who are worthy of my worship. You killed Madhusudana, you killed the demon, but you want me to be Drona Sudana and uh, Bhishma Sudana. You want me to kill my teacher, my grandfather. You killed the demon, but you want me to kill my teacher, my grandfather. So, you know, this is. The, Arjuna was arguing like this to Krishna, expressing his compassion that how we can engage in these sinful activities. But Krishna said to Arjuna, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. So Krishna immediately took the position of the teacher. And the business of the teacher is not to flatter, but the business of the teacher is to chastise and to bring the student, to wake him up and get him out of his ignorance, out of his lethargy. Uh, Prabhupada often described his own spiritual master, how his spiritual master was like Nishinga Guru, he would, you know, he would shout and he would chastise. He wouldn't let people just simply get away with ignorance and laziness. And similarly, Srila Prabhupada, if he saw people sitting in the class with their eyes closed, he would say, why are you sleeping? And if the devotee said, I'm not sleeping, Prabhupada would say, if your eyes are closed and you're not moving, you must be asleep. <laughs> like this, Prabhupada was arguing to the devotees, chastising them, getting, bringing them to uh, be attentive and to take uh, an interest in what he was presenting, what he was trying to teach us. So this is the business of the teacher. Prabhupada quotes Chanakya Pandit that the business of the father and the guru is to find the fault not to flatter and praise, but to find the fault. And that's the important thing. And that way you get the person to work harder and put more effort in and give the best performance they actually can. Tamal Krishna Goswami 
used to say that if someone said to him, I'm doing the best I can, he would say to them, then that means you're in Maya. <laughs> he, he didn't, he said, if somebody thinks they're doing the best I can, he, he wouldn't accept that. He said, you can always do better, you can do more. You shouldn't think I'm doing the best I can. You should think I, I, I should do better, I should do more. This, this is the mood of these uh, powerful teachers that they really want to bring out the best. We have a saying in China, you know, I preach in China, so there's a saying in China, Yan Shi Chu Gao Tu, that the strict teacher will bring out the best student. They will have the best student. That you want your child to get a good education, you need to put them in a school where the teachers are very strict. Because you have a strict teacher, then you'll learn. I know myself, when I was in school, <laughs> I remember, when we had a strict teacher, I would make sure I'd always do the homework. Other teachers I wouldn't bother about, I just, joke and play around, but if I knew that teacher's really strict, I'd make a point to always do their homework. And so like that, the strict teacher will bring out the best in this, you will make the best students. So Srila Prabhupada was the best teacher and he shows us, he taught us by his uh, own example, his own spiritual master had chastised him. Right? There's a famous pastime. Prabhupada was sitting in the class hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and the man behind him touched him on the shoulder to say something to him. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati at this point was on the stage speaking and when he saw Prabhupada, when he saw our Prabhupada turn around to see the person behind him, then Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati immediately stopped and pointed to them, you two, what are you doing? And he, he said to the one man, the, old, the man who touched our Prabhupada on the shoulder, he said, do you think you have purchased me because you donate 10 rupees every month? You know, sometimes we think I'm giving money to the temple, so I'm really, a, I can do whatever I want. I, I'm a really important devotee. That sometimes that, that kind of ignorance is there. Sometimes we think I'm a big collector, so I'm really important in the temple. But that kind of illusion is also there among devotees sometimes. We have to be very conscious and careful. So Bhaktisiddhanta said to him, Do you think you purchased me because you donate some money every month? And then he pointed to our own Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Do you want to come up here and speak? And Srila Prabhupada told us, he said, it was the moment of greatest mercy. He said, I was mortified. I could have died on the spot. I was so ashamed. So after that, then of course he would be very careful not to speak in the present, not to speak during the lectures of his spiritual teacher. So this, this is compassion, bringing out the ignorance. And of course, bring, seeing our own ignorance, it can be painful for us. It's not a very pleasant thing. It's very painful. Prabhupada gives the example, just like it, you have a boil on your hand or on your wrist, and you go to the doctor, the doctor said, I, I, I will just get the knife and lance it. And you may say, oh, no, 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 don't do that, no, just, just give me some medicine, or just blow some cold air on it, or just maybe we'll put some water on it. Don't cut me, it will be painful. But the doctor said, no, 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 I have to cut you. I have to do it. <laughs> right? So a little pain is required in order to get cured. So the same way, so to, in order to come to the platform of real knowledge and realization, sometimes we have to be willing to accept a little pain and discomfort to 
bring us to the proper platform of understanding is very important, very vital for us because we have this human body and our time is limited. We don't know how long we have in this world. We don't know if this pandemic is going to stop or if it's going to get worse. We don't know what's going to happen. There have been plagues in the past where whole cities have been wiped out. We don't know what's going to happen. Therefore, a devotee is very conscious to take the opportunity to become very serious in their practice of Krishna consciousness. We see in Srimad Bhagavatam, Maharaj Parikshit wanted to hear from Sukadeva Goswami, what is the duty of one who is about to die? And what is the duty of all people at all time? And Sukadeva Goswami replied, he said, well, it's the same for both of them. Whether you're about to die or you don't know when you're going to die. The duty is the same. We have to hear, chant and remember about the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is our actual duty. We should not be in any illusion about the duty of this human form of life. It's very, very special, very rare opportunity. And our time is very precious. Time. Prabhupada quotes Chanakya, you can buy gold, you cannot buy time. Time is the most precious thing. Therefore, we're very conscious to try to use every moment for the service of Krishna to, wake, to help us to progress in our Krishna consciousness. We have this valuable opportunity. We have come to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. We have an opportunity to render some service. Of course, we're very insignificant. Each and every one of us, we're insignificant souls. What can we do? But just making some effort on our part, some insignificant attempt will be recognized by Krishna. Just like we see insignificant, seemingly insignificant devotees, how they were recognized by Lord Krishna. Sudama Brahman, a poverty-stricken Brahmana, nobody thought he was very important, but Lord Krishna recognized him and worshipped him and honored him. Similarly, Kolaveka Sridhar, in the times of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Nobody even knew who he was. He was only known to Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had to tell the devotees where to find Sridhar. Go there and bring him to me. And of course when Sridhar came, then Lord Chaitanya is offering Sridhar blessings. What can I give you? I know you're very poor. Your home is a just a hovel, you have no proper cloth, it's all rags. Let me give you opulence, give you wealth. But Sridhar says, no, it's, it's all right. I just want to go on as I am doing. Giving my 50% of whatever income I get to spend on the worship of Mother Ganga. I'm happy. The birds live in the nest, in the tree, and the kings live in the palace. Everyone is suffering and enjoying according to their past deeds. Why should I change anything? This is, it's my position. I'm put in, in this situation by the arrangement of Krishna. Let me go on with my duty. So this is the mood of the devotee, the thinking of a devotee. He's not concerned with his own self. He's thinking about others. We have also the wonderful example, Prahlad Maharaj, in his prayers to Lord Nishringadev. Prahlad Maharaj tells Lord Nishringadev that 
I'm not concerned for my own self. Wherever I go, I can chant and hear the glories of the Lord. But I am concerned with love for those who have ab simply absorbed themselves in the family and the children and in their prosperity and material life. I'm concerned for these foolish people who are ded dedicating their life trying to find happiness in the material energy without any Krishna consciousness. I'm concerned for them. Some people, they go to the mountains. There are great yogis and aesthetics. They leave the world. They go off to the mountain. They may sit in the cave or in the forest in seclusion. Prahlad Maharaj said, I don't want to do that. I want to go in the cities where the people are. I want to try to save the people, to give them Krishna consciousness. There was one devotee in, uh, in the 1970s, one devotee, uh, he came with Prabhupada to India. Very nice brahmachari and he was, you know, playing very nice madanga and leading good kirtans and everything. He's a young American man, healthy, good looking. And he was doing very nice service and he said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I'm thinking that maybe I should go to the Himalayas and find a, an ashram there and get my brahmacharya in order. Because he said, here, I'm traveling with you and we have many women with us also, young women, attractive women traveling with us also. So it's very disturbing to my brahmacharya life. So I'm thinking if I could go to the mountains, up the Himalayas, maybe Hardwa, Rishikesh, I'll find some ashram there and stay there. Will that be okay, Prabhupada? And Prabhupada said, oh no, please do not do that. That is not what I would like you to, to see you do. That is not what we want. We don't want to encourage that at all. You simply stay with us and you continue. If you want, you can always become a householder. If your agitation is so great, you can give up the brahmacharya. That's better than going off to the mountains and just being a recluse. So Prahlad Maharaj was saying, some people, they go off like that to the mountains or to the forest. They're only thinking of their own liberation. They're also selfish. They're thinking only of their own liberation. But Prahlad Maharaj said, I don't want to be like that. I want to go where the people are, in the cities, in the towns, and give Krishna Kant. I want to give the spiritual benefit to these people. That is the thinking of the devotee. When we, just like we, we build our centers, we don't just think to find a nice quiet place away from everyone. We think, where are the people? Where can the, you know, make it easy for the people to come? We don't want to go away from the people, we want to go to the people, to give them the message of Krishna. Very important. So Prahlad Maharaj expresses this so nicely in his prayers. And then we see also the example in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, Vasudev Datta, how he, he told Lord Chaitanya that let me take the sins of all the sinful people. Let me take their sins and I will stay here and suffer. Let them all go back to God. That is, that mood was so much appreciated by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I have sold my heart to Vasudev Datta. He has purchased me by these words. Th that mood of selflessness, not selfish, but selfless. No thought for one's own self. 
but thinking of the well-being of others, that is actually devotee. Full of compassion for the welfare of others, for the fallen conditioned souls. Fallen conditioned souls are in plenty. Wherever you go around the planet, you can find the fallen conditioned souls. We don't have to look very hard to find fallen conditioned souls. We're not far away from fallen conditioned souls ourselves, but somehow we got the mercy of the spiritual master, which saved us from that situation. Brahmanda Brahmite Kunya Bhagavan Jeev Guru Krishna Prasadi Pai Bhakti Lata Beach. From the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we learn that we get that we that we become fortunate, Kunya Bhagavan Jeev, when we get the mercy of the spiritual master who plants that seed of devotion in our heart. So we are so fortunate that we received that seed, we want to also make others fortunate. We're not just happy to be fortunate ourselves. I'm saved. We should think about others, how to save others. Therefore we think how to distribute this Krishna consciousness, how to give it to others, how to bring others into the shelter of Lord Krishna. So appreciating uh, the, the duty of a devotee, appreciating first of all our own self, that, that is the, the beginning of self-realization, right? Vedanta Sutra begins, Atato Brahma Jignasa, that now you've got the human form of life, we should understand what is Brahman. What is the difference between the body and soul? And then Vedanta Sutra goes on to tell us, Janma Jashya Yato Navayat, that the Vedanta Sutra goes on to describe that there is the Supreme Lord who is the cause of the creation, the maintenance and the destruction of this universe. So one who is actually inquiring into self-realization they have to understand not only the Self, but also the Supreme Self, that Personality who is behind everything, that one Supreme Lord, in whom all contradictions are resolved, because He is the Absolute Truth. I was reading uh, talks between Lord Krishna and Rukmini. Of course, Lord Krishna had been joking with Rukmini, he wanted to arouse her anger. But Rukmini is not of that nature, she doesn't get angry so easily, she's very a gentle woman. She does, she's not like, you know, there's the left-wing gopi and the right-wing gopis, and some gopis they get angry very easily and other gopis are very humble and gentle and meek. So different kinds of gopis. So in the same way among the queens of Dwarka, you have people like Rukmini and you have people like Satyabhama, different natures. So when Krishna is joking with Rukmini, Rukmini took it all very seriously and she fainted. And Lord Krishna had to pick her up and reassure her that, oh, I'm only joking. Because Lord Krishna had been saying to her, you know, at the time of our marriage, there were so many kings wanted to marry you, and I kidnapped you. I forced you, to, I took you away from home. You could have married one of those kings. And they were so wealthy and powerful, and they had kingdoms. Lord Krishna said, I don't have anything. I don't know why you came with me. I don't know why you're with me. I, Lord Krishna was telling Rukmini, I don't think I'm a fit husband for you. I think you should go, and maybe one of these kings will take you. Of course, at this time, Rukmini and Krishna were already grandparents. Their children had already grown up and had children, had their own children. So, some time, they had been married for a long time. But still, Krishna was teasing Rukmini in this way. He wanted to, maybe he can make her angry. 
but just the opposite, she fainted and then uh, when she recovered and she was assured that Krishna wasn't going to leave her, that he was only joking, playing joking words with her, then Rukmini began to reply to the different things which Krishna had been saying. And she said to Krishna that, you say that I should go to the kings, but she said, who are the kings? Who are actually these kings? She said, I don't think Jarasandha, Sishupal, these people are the kings. The kings, the real kings are the three modes of nature. It's the three modes of nature which are the, right, actually ruling everyone. The material energy in the form of the three modes of nature is ruling all of us. And then she went on to say, the kings are also the, the, our senses. These senses are the kings because we're just simply slave to our senses. Whatever our senses want, we act under the inspiration, the direction of our senses. And Lord Krishna had been saying that I, I'm poor, I don't have any kingdom, I have no wealth. Lord, and, and Rukmini said, yeah, this is true, I know, you're the poor, you have nothing, but you don't need anything either because everything is yours. It's all, all you, everything is you. So you don't need to possess anything because it's all yours anyway. When you say you're the poorest, yeah, you have nothing. But at the same time, you're, you are the richest because you are everything. All the wealth is actually yours. It's all yours. It doesn't belong to anybody else. We, they, we may have it for some time, but actually it's all Krishna's. Everything that we see, is Krishna's property, all his. But he doesn't, he's not attached to any of it. So he possesses everything, but at the same time he's the poorest. And he's worshipped by the demigods like Shiva and Brahma, other people, they come and worship the demigods. They come and worship Lord Shiva and Brahma to get blessings, to get benedictions, tell, they tell the devas what they want. But these same devas, they come and worship the Supreme Lord Krishna. He is the, the one above all, above everyone. So we want to understand the absolute position of Lord Krishna in this world. And then we can actually surrender to him. Understanding his uh, inconceivable potencies. This has uh, been very vividly described to us in the section of the Brahmana of Brahma Vimohan Lila. How Lord Krishna took, could expand himself. That when he became these cows and cowherd boys, they were all directly him. They were not just simply expansions like, a, you know, an, a re reflection on water, you may see something reflection. It's not like that. But Krishna, he, he directly became these cows and these cowherd boys. He could appear in so many different forms. This is his inconceivable potencies. So this is something which we have to always present to people to help them to understand the nature of Lord Krishna's pastimes. That there is such a thing as a chincha shakti, the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. And this is how the cowherd boys uh, and, the, and the cows were all expanded through Krishna's achincha shakti. And all the people, the, the, the elderly gopi ladies, the mothers of the coward boys and the cows who were the mothers of the calves, they all became more attracted, more attached to their children and to their calves because Krishna has come. And the thing which we're more attached to than any, anything else is Krishna. 
It's not just only our body, but we're thinking our self. And when we actually understand the self, then we know that the self is a part of Krishna. And the thing which we're most attached to over everything is Krishna. And that's why the cows and the mothers, they gave so much love to these uh, offspring who were all actually Krishna. Okay, so we will stop here, ask if there's any questions. Hare Krishna. Good day. Yeah. Dang is Shabba, Jan Kra. Oh, 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 oh. And any questions here today? Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhu, please ask. Thank you, Maharaj. I had a small question. The initial of the regarding the translation you mentioned this verse. I mean, here we can clearly say the theme comes that I is greater than mine. And so, what are the, if you see, I am more important than the things which are related to me. But on contrary, we see some examples. Sometimes we see uh, there are people who lay down their lives for the country. There are people who lay down their lives for families. So, it seems that I is actually less than mine. So, how to understand this concept? People are ready to leave their life also at some point, some point of time, for the sake of mine. So, how to understand this example? Yes, well, it's not the same for everyone, but some people are more in the conscious of I, but there are those people who are more, in, you know, they also think about mine. But when they think about mine, they think of it as the extended I. They, they're thinking that my family. So it's just an extension of the I concept. Not that they're giving up the connection with the my, with the my but they're thinking because it's my family, because it's my property, therefore I care about it so much. It's not just only thinking, I. Some people certainly, they will give up everything. They don't think about others. I, sometimes even when we, when we become devotees, sometimes even the family may come and they may critis criticize us and say that, you know, you're selfish. You're only thinking about yourself. You're not caring about your parents. You're not caring about your family. You come here and you become Hare Krishna devotee and chant and you're not caring about others. And they accuse us of being selfish. You're only thinking about your own self. They don't understand that there is a higher concept to Krishna consciousness, that we become Krishna conscious not just only for our own self, but to do some good for the world, to give benefit to everyone. Not just only our own family, but everyone. The chanting of Hare Krishna and the preaching of Krishna consciousness benefits everyone. In the nectar of devotion it's described how the path, the path of bhakti creates all auspiciousness. The beginning of all auspiciousness. It's welfare work for the benefit of the whole, whole world. All living entities benefit by Krishna consciousness by the work of the devotee, by our chanting Hare Krishna, and by our distribution of Krishna consciousness, the whole world benefits. So some people are thinking in terms of I, they're thinking I, just simply me, the body. But other people are thinking my, and sometimes it, the concept of my is greater, the attachment to the my is greater than the concept of I. But it's, it's the same, it, it, it's just an extension of the I, that my, my family, my children. When people get married, the, the man will say, my wife, or the woman will say, my husband. They're thinking, my, my, but I, 
the things in relation to I, just simply an, ex an extension of the I concept. So trying to understand this connection, I and mind, it's certainly very dominant in the material society, material world. You know, some people, they're very much more, they think more about the concept of my, minus, they work hard, try to do good, help others. But it's the extension of the I concept. They do it still in the bodily conception of life. I don't know if that helps you at all. Maybe you can ask some again. Sometimes you see that the people lives are growing up, means the concept of I is getting completely destroyed. Because let's say example of some, uh, a person is getting killed to protect his family. So now if you see the example here, this I, the person who is considering the, the person I is actually getting destroyed for the sake of mind. So now it's, you know, there, there are incidents like this, people lay down their life for the sake of mind. There are many Indian uh, historians who completely, you know, uh, given their lives for the South sake of India, for the same countries in the world. So, how to understand this? The concept of I is completely destroyed for the sake of mind. So, is it that sometimes mind is greater than I, or I is greater than mind is always? Yes, definitely sometimes. And for, for some people, the concept of mind will be greater than I. Why? Because of the attachment to the I. Because of the attachment to the I, there's a stronger attachment to what's mine. And so they think of the family. Why do they think of the family? Because they're thinking I. They're thinking, first of all, they think I'm the body and these are my family. So the I concept is there, although it may seem to be neglected and for the sake of the mind, but still that concept of I is there. It's just simply that the, the my concept has become the expansion or the extension of that I concept. That's how I see it. That although they think, you, you may say that, oh, they sacrificed the I for the my, so that their concept of my was greater than I, but that I concept was still there. And because of that attachment to the I, they're thinking the body, they were attached to the things in relation to the body. Just simply the extension of the I concept. So they, they sacrifice, yes, true, there are many workers, great, you know, heroes in the, in the world, politicians and like that, they're considered great people, they sacrifice for others. But they're still in that concept. They're thinking, I, I am Indian. I am this party, political party. I am this community. I am this family. And therefore, this is mine. So it, it's just practically, it's the same thing, I and mine. The mine is the extension of the I. It's, and, but it's not always the case that we do see the, the verse describes how people neglect the my for the sake of I, and examples are given. There are examples, he gives examples in the purport. So it's not in every case, but some cases, some people, they do, they care more about the my than they do about the I. They will sacrifice, just like sometimes the mother has no money to buy clothes, she will buy clothes for the child and she's wearing rags herself. She doesn't buy any cloth for herself, she gives everything for the child. Or the, there's no food, the mother will feed the child before she feeds herself. And she will eat whatever the child doesn't eat. And so there are many examples like that where the concept of my is greater than the concept of I. Definitely it's a fact. Why is it like that? Well, it's, again, it's due to the, the conception of I, 
The mother is thinking, my child. The attachment to the child is greater than to any other child because they're thinking, my child. So it's just, what, what could we say? Wet stool and dry stool. Both stool. You know, both ignorance. Whether it's I or mine, it's just different kinds of ignorance. Any other question? Uh, thank you, Maharaj. So, Maharaj, you were uh, telling about how when teacher is strict, may, uh, actually uh, students benefit a lot and uh, students can become better students. But sometimes in modern times we see if teacher is strict, uh, uh, they are punished by the government. There are so many laws nowadays that teacher cannot uh, scold to students, teacher cannot do so many things. So. Uh, uh, what to do in this current scenario when, you know? Uh... Yeah, that's, it's true. Yeah, these kind of laws have made it more difficult for education. More di the job of teaching becomes a greater challenge that you cannot just simply threaten. But they have to use their skill as a teacher to inspire the students. You know, Prabhu, Prabhupada also said, Nobody, the, the children in the Gurukula, nobody should beat them, nobody should hit them. But he said, Prabhupada, he gave the example, he said, uh, you can show the stick, but you don't use it. And there's a picture of Prabhupada holding his cane like that, you see? And he's threatening, and the boys are all holding out their hand. And the boys are all laughing, they want, they want Prabhupada to hit them. So, we have a saying, to spare the rod is to spoil the child. That if the child is not beaten, then the child will become spoiled. But at the same time, Prabhupada didn't want the children to be beaten. But he wanted that by genuine love and genuine care, then the children will learn to be obedient and they will behave properly. That, so that's important. That's why uh, our Gurukula here in Mayapur, they have, they're very careful about what boys they, they will bring into the Gurukul. They have to see their nature, that they're suited for the education, that they're ready, to, they're willing to be educated and to uh, behave properly, to come to the right standard. So they have laws like that in England also now, they don't beat when I was at school, they used to beat, but nowadays they don't beat. What they do now, they just send you home. That you don't want to behave properly, go home. We don't want you here. And they just send them home. So that's the, that's the alternative, that the child doesn't want to learn, he disturbs the class, the teacher can just say, go, I don't want you in the class. And so that's the ultimate method of teaching. You want to learn, you have to cooperate, you have to be obedient. Just like uh, in the Prabhupada gives the example that in Kashmir, long, about a hundred years ago or more, if somebody stole, the king could cut off the arm. And if somebody's a thief, they would cut off the hand. The king right in the spot would cut off the arm of the thief. And so nobody would steal. Everybody knew that well, if I steal, they could, they'll cut off my arm or something. Nobody wants that, so nobody would steal. So even so, if somebody lost something, it would just be left lying. Nobody would want to touch it. So that, that because they knew if they took something which was not theirs, they could be killed. So like that, that's a, one way of uh, teaching people, getting people to behave properly. So education also, people want education. They want to learn. They have to behave properly. If they don't cooperate with the teacher, then the teacher doesn't want them in the class. Not that you beat them. Beating, what good is that? that you beat the child, then what? One, one, one lady I knew in Malaysia, she was a teacher. She said, uh, if, if anybody was to do anything to the, 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 the student, the student would come and get their car. 
they'd find the teacher's car and they would scratch it and rip the tires and they'd really damage it. Because, yeah, they'd do these kind of things, you know, just to get revenge. Oh, that teacher was so nasty to me, they did this to me. And they would just take revenge, they'd do these kind of things. So, dealing with students is a, it's a very difficult thing, it's a, a real challenge. To, and, and similarly, we deal with devotees, taking care of devotees, because these kind of problems can also come up within our movement, in getting people to cooperate and to work together. So it's important to, to keep nice relationships based on love and trust, and inspiring others by, our, by the example. So, strict teachers, yes, Prabhupada was a strict teacher, but he was very loving and kind also, and caring. So both sides have to be there. Yes, Maharaj, thank you very much for such a wonderful and beautiful answer. All right, so... Any other question, Prabhu? Anybody has any question? Please. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Prabhu, uh, so again, we're very grateful to Yashamati Nandan Prabhu for his wonderful contribution to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. He worked very hard, 50 years, spreading Krishna Consciousness, translated all of Prabhupada's books to Gujarati, he would personally go out and distribute them. He brought, he had a big family, quite a few children, brought them all up to be devotees, put them in the Gurukula. So we're, we're very sure he has a wonderful destination. Krishna must have taken him back home to be with him, or he's going to be with Prabhupada and the other devotees who he loves so much. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak on Srimad Bhagavatam and thank you for your association. Srila Prabhupada ki. Jai. Gaur Bhakti Vrinda ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. His own is Bhakti Vikna Vinayak Narsim Swam Maharaj ki. Jai. Thank you Maharaj for such a wonderful and inspiring class. Uh, you explained so nicely about this concept of i and my and also about Vaishnav compassion and you so many beautiful pastimes and what is the mood and consciousness which is very pleasing to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and uh, what was the mood of Prabhupada also. So thank you very much for you know, Hare really Krishna. wonderful. Thank you very much. So hope I can come to Calcutta soon. Uh, Hare you Krishna. Are most welcome. We hope and pray uh, that you can come to Calcutta and we can serve you. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki. Hare.